All right, then uh, I'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, Paul, for that introduction, uh, kind of taking everybody on a journey through my past. <laughs> Uh, what has led me here uh, to working with the Houston Galveston Area Council. Uh, so I'm excited to talk to everybody today about how watershed communities can get involved uh, with taking action to improve water quality uh, throughout the region and especially in the Woodlands area. So one of the reasons I'm really excited to talk to this group is because I know you already have interest and engagement in um, interacting with water quality and environmental quality in your area. And uh, my hope with today's presentation is to maybe just get you in touch uh, with a few more tools or a few more ideas for how you can, uh, at the individual level, uh, get involved with environmental quality near you. And also what to expect from some higher levels, you know, on up to local government or even uh, state and federal involvement. So we'll talk about all of those topics today. So just to kind of walk everybody through uh, what this presentation will look like, I'll spend a little bit of time on introduction, uh, kind of discussing some of the building block concepts of uh, water quality management, uh, especially pertaining to this region. Uh, and then we'll move on to talking about uh, some of the watersheds local to the Woodlands area. We'll talk about the San Jacinto River Basin and some of the neighboring watersheds uh, of the Spring Creek watershed, which of course is the, the major watershed for the Woodlands area. And then uh, we'll finally wrap up uh, with talking about some action strategies. And like I mentioned, we'll look at different levels of uh, community organizations from the state and federal government level all the way down to the individual. So that's just a brief layout of what to expect. So we'll start with the introduction, start with the basics. And I think probably the best place to start is to explain uh, where I'm coming from and who I work for. So I'm a member of the, the Houston Galveston Area Council. Uh, so the Houston Galveston Area Council is a council of governments, which includes all of the 13 counties listed on this map uh, here to the left of the screen. And over 100 cities uh, within those county boundaries are also uh, members uh, of the, the decision-making arm of the Houston Galveston Area Council. Uh, so this group is a non-regulatory planning organization, and I'll admit, um, you know, before I started working at the Houston Galveston Area Council, I had no idea how many uh, different projects that they're involved in throughout the region and kind of how broadly the net is cast uh, for, for how many projects that they're involved with. Uh, so just one small slice of the Houston Galveston Area Council is the Community Environmental Planning Department. Uh, so this department helps to facilitate community projects uh, throughout the region that are focused mainly on economic development and then things that are a little bit more in my wheelhouse, which is uh, maintaining and enhancing uh, the environment around us. So even within uh, the broader umbrella of the community environmental department, uh, planning department is uh, my specific team, which is the water resources team. And they also uh, have their hands in a lot of pies throughout the region when it comes to uh, water resources. Uh, so I did just want to point out a few selected programs. So this is not the comprehensive list of what the, the water resources team is involved with, um, but these are some kind of highlight programs uh, that I'll probably be referencing throughout the, the presentation today. So I did want to draw them to your attention. Uh, so we have the Clean Rivers Program, which is kind of our monitoring arm um, of our department where uh, we actually manage and coordinate and uh, personally participate in water quality sampling throughout the region. And we'll talk more about that in more detail in some of the following slides here. Uh, we also have the Water Quality Management uh, Planning Group, uh, which provides data analysis of wastewater infrastructure, uh, watershed planning, and sources of non-point source pollution in the watershed. So again, that's another topic that we'll really get into the weeds on uh, a little bit later on in the presentation. And then of course, there are water watershed place uh, based plans uh, that we helped organize throughout the region. Uh, and this is kind of a broad term that captures things such as watershed protection plans and also total maximum daily load implementation plans. They both kind of fall under that watershed based plan umbrella. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, all of these things in a little bit more detail as we go on. 
So I want you to keep in mind uh, this map to the left again of the, the 13 county area that the, the Houston Galveston Area Council serves. And we're going to look at it now from the perspective of natural boundaries. So we're not looking at political county boundaries anymore. Uh, now we're looking at how the water actually connects us. So I'll be using the term watershed a lot through this presentation. I believe it was first word in the title. <laughs> so it is pretty important to get a hold on this concept. Uh, so just to define what a watershed is, that's the area of land that drains to a common waterway. So if you'll look at this map on the right here, uh, this represents the lower Galveston Bay watershed area. So all of this area, land area, that is highlighted in this kind of navy blue color in the background represents land area uh, that ultimately drains into the Galveston Bay. And so again, this is just the lower portion of the watershed. You'll see the Trinity River extends even beyond uh, the borders of this map. Uh, that goes all the way up to the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, so <clears throat> the total watershed area for Galveston Bay extends even further uh, all the way up towards Dallas-Fort Worth. But we're just focused on this lower Galveston Bay uh, watershed area because that is where our 13 county region uh, is situated. So, when we're talking in terms of watershed boundaries, uh, these can vary in scale depending on what the uh, common water body or terminal water body is. Uh, so when we're talking about Galveston Bay, again, this whole area uh, can potentially drain into Galveston Bay. Uh, but if we want to kind of narrow that focus and just look at land area that drains into the San Jacinto River, uh, we can focus more on this side of the watershed and we'll talk about the concept of kind of sub watersheds and how uh, fine of a scale we can work down to uh, in some of the later slides. But I did want to point out that uh, watershed is not a, a fixed thing. Uh, it is determined by uh, the common water body that we're we're talking about draining into. And so the real concept that I wanted to drive home with this slide is that what happens on the land uh, has the potential to impact the waterways. So anything that's going on in this entire land area ultimately has the potential to impact uh, waters in Galveston Bay uh, and so on. So we do need to be kind of mindful of what's going on in our local communities uh, as these could have broader impacts on water quality. So we've talked about, oops, click the wrong thing, click the wrong thing again. <laughs> I'll just use the keyboard. There we go. All right. So we've talked about uh, watersheds and how those connect us. So let's talk a little bit more about um, water uses and what uh, water helps to support throughout the region. And the answer to that is a lot of things. So uh, I think we could start at the top by talking about how uh, clean water resources support our economy. So, of course, that's critical for uh, fisheries, for recreation. Uh, it's shown that uh, property value increases with proximity to some kind of water feature. Uh, we use water for transportation, industry, irrigation for agriculture. So good, high quality water resources are critical for all of these services. And we also look to uh, high quality water for improving our lives. So access to clean water is critical for public health, uh, for quality of life. And even, I think it has to be said, aesthetic value, um, you know, when, when we as a community uh, appreciate a water body uh, that is local to us that kind of connects us with our environment. It gets us invested in wanting to preserve uh, the quality of that water body. So I think aesthetic value is, is just as, as valuable as some of these other services. And then of course, sustaining the ecology. So humans by far are not the only uh, critters that uh, use clean water. Um, we have to share the environment uh, with the local ecology. So we need clean water for all of these things. Uh, so let's talk about some of the potential sources of pollution uh, that could threaten the quality of water uh, in our area. So by and large uh, in our region, throughout the 13 county region, kind of the number one offender or the, the most common uh, type of pollution is derived from fecal waste in the waterways. So 
uh, the way that we measure uh, the presence of fecal waste in the waterways is we actually uh, sample water uh, for the presence or absence uh, of this uh, of a few particular organisms. So there's Escherichia coli, uh, which is a bacteria that is more common, uh, commonly looked at in freshwater environments, and another bacteria called Enterococci, which is more commonly looked at in uh, tidally influenced or saltwater environments. Um, and these particular bacteria species are known as fecal indicator bacteria because they're commonly found in the digestive systems of animals. So humans, pets, uh, agricultural animals, wildlife, everybody. So when we see <clears throat> high levels of those bacteria in the waterways, we can kind of make the assumption that the way they got there was through fecal waste. So it's a widespread problem. It's not endemic to the woodlands specifically, or, uh, you know, it's really a regional issue. <clears throat> so there are two main sources of delivery for this particular type of pollution. Uh, one is a point source. So if you picture, let's say, uh, a wastewater treatment facility is not properly managing uh, their discharge that they uh, discharge directly into a water body. Uh, and if the bacteria level of that discharge is too high, then we can point to that wastewater treatment facility as the point uh, of pollution. And we can identify them as the source that is impacting that water body. So when we address those point sources, that's more of an end of pipe uh, kind of strategy. Uh, because we're we're addressing the pollution problem, you know, at the source. So another way that bacteria can enter the waterways is through non-point source delivery. And so that is a little bit trickier to pin down or to trace uh, because the way that it enters the waterway is more likely going to be an effect of runoff uh, or high flow during a storm event, washing these sources of pollution off the land and into the waterways. So it's a little bit harder to backtrack it to a, a specific source, but we know uh, some of the, the kind of usual suspects uh, that we look for as non-point sources of pollution. So this includes fecal waste uh, from human sources. So if you think about maybe an on-site sewage facility uh, that is not well maintained or has uh, failed and caused an overflow, uh, even though that might be um, far away from a waterway, uh, the, the effects of that failure could be washed off the land and into a nearby waterway. Um, so that could have a kind of indirect impact on our waterways. Same thing goes for pet waste, uh, agricultural waste, wildlife waste, and waste from invasive species. So some other sources that we look to as um, non-point sources of contamination uh, include runoff from lawns, uh, including fertilizers that might end up in our waterways. Uh, and we also look to trash and illegal dumping. So trash, again, is uh, not really a direct source of pollution. Of course, it's a physical obstruction, and that comes with a host of other problems. But we can also be worried about what might be carried on that trash. So um, there could be contaminants uh, or bacteria or, or anything on those items of trash that end up in our waterways. So it's kind of uh, two problems for the price of one. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some of the potential impacts uh, from these sources of pollution. So at the top of the list, obviously, impacts to human health and aquatic life. So uh, where we do see the presence of fecal waste, we also need to be concerned about the presence of pathogens, especially when we're talking about uh, human waste that might have impacted the waterway, uh, because that has a higher likelihood of transmission of those harmful pathogens that might be traveling along with that fecal waste. Uh, this is also harmful to aquatic life, that goes without saying. And with these types of events, we often also see uh, high levels of increased nutrients uh, in the waterways. And where we see high nutrients in the waterways, this can lead to other problems, including uh, low levels of oxygen. Sometimes when there are too many nutrients in a water body, this can encourage a, an algal bloom, uh, which can in turn lower the oxygen in the water column and lead to fish kills and other problems. Uh, so it's all kind of connected. And really when we focus on addressing the bacteria problem, um, 
our hope is that we also have positive impacts on these other factors like nutrient concentrations and low oxygen in the water. So we're kind of killing two birds with one stone uh, when we target bacteria uh, impairments. So some other challenges uh, that we need to consider, and I do want to say challenge here, it's not really a threat. I don't want to indicate that uh, development and growth is a, a bad thing. It's just something that we kind of have to keep in mind, especially um, as a community invested in improving water quality, uh, keeping in mind that the landscape is going to change as a result of growth and development is important for incorporating into our watershed improvement strategies uh, because the solution that might work today uh, may not be as effective Effective, you know, 20 years down the line, uh, respective to growth. So I keep referencing it, but I haven't explained it yet. Uh, growth is expected to rapidly increase uh, in this region. So throughout the 13 county area, we're expected to see another 4 million people join us by the year 2045. And when these people come into our region, they're going to need places to live. Uh, so we expect to see increased suburban development uh, along with this population boom. And then, of course, there will be other structures to support these suburban areas uh, like commercial structures. And what that ultimately means is that more impervious surface area is going to come into play. So with this increase in development, this is going to physically change the landscape. And what it will do is in areas that might currently be more natural land cover, such as forest and wetlands, or kind of semi-natural, like a, a pasture or a grassland, uh, these areas, as they are, have the ability to kind of absorb uh, rainfall events during heavy storms uh, and keep that water uh, filtrated into the soil. And along with rain events, it filtrates, uh, you know, contaminants. So it's a natural filter for us. But when we cover that with impervious surface, then we lose that kind of uh, ecosystem benefit uh, of those natural land types. Uh, because with that impervious, impervious surface, uh, the water is not going to be able to infiltrate into the soil. It's just going to slough along the top of these impervious surface layers, and it can exacerbate problems for us like flooding. So this also ties into water quality uh, because it's going to increase runoff, um, and that can ultimately impact our, our water bodies. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So we've talked about what water is used for and some of the challenges faced by water uh, and how that can impact water quality. But I think it's also important to talk about how we actually measure water quality uh, or determine whether water is meeting water quality standards. And so I mentioned it briefly before, but I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail here. Uh, so again, this is a good time to shout out the Clean Rivers Program uh, through the Houston Galveston Area Council, which ultimately works in conjunction with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Uh, and so the Clean Rivers Program, both members of HGAC staff and our partners throughout the region. So that includes the San Jacinto River Authority, uh, United States Geological Service, uh, the Environmental Institute of Houston. Those are just a, a few off the top of my head, but I know we have a, a network of partners throughout the region that help us actually do the sampling uh, on a regular basis. Uh, so we go out to local water bodies and collect surface water, and then we look uh, at these samples and analyze them for levels of bacteria, uh, for nutrients and dissolved oxygen. So again, I said bacteria, but I'm referring specifically to uh, fecal indicator bacteria uh, like E. coli and uh, enterococci that help us determine if there's uh, uh, fecal waste in the waterways. And then on occasion, uh, some other factors may be looked at. Um, that's kind of a case by case basis. We might look at uh, toxin levels in the water, especially if we have reason to believe uh, there could be impacts there. Uh, I know, especially along the ship channel and areas like that, there's a, an expanded suite of uh, factors that are looked at. Uh, but generally, for most water bodies, you're going to find data for bacteria, nutrients, and dissolved oxygen. And so once we have these water quality samples on hand, uh, we have to compare them uh, or the concentrations of each of these parameters. We compare those to state water quality standards, which are based on uh, whatever the water 
body is being used for. So uh, there are different criteria for different uses. Um, for example, um, contact recreation. So anytime you are swimming or wading in the water uh, and coming into contact with the water, there's a specific criteria for uh, fecal indicator bacteria uh, that can't be crossed. Otherwise, that water body is deemed unsafe. Um, so by comparing our water quality samples to the state water quality standards uh, based on those different uses, uh, we can identify which water bodies throughout our region that need improvement. Um, yeah, so this kind of takes us to our first uh, break uh, in the presentation. So I did just want to slow down for a second and ask if anybody has any questions at this point before we move on to talk about local watersheds. Oh, I see a flash in the chat, maybe. Uh, frequency of water sampling. Um, I think it varies uh, depending on the water body. Um, I have to get back to you on that because I don't want to speak out of turn, um, but I think it does vary depending on the water body. Um, but I know, I think we aim for at least quarterly uh, to hit each of the water bodies uh, in our region. Rachel, I had asked him to put any questions you might have in chat. Okay. So that we, and uh, that's the question. Whatever the frequency is, we wouldn't be at all disappointed if we increased it. Right? Sure. <laughs> I don't, I don't see any other questions here. Go ahead. Right. I think, I think it's slowed down in the chat. So we'll go ahead and keep moving, uh, but feel free to keep uh, putting questions in the chat. There will be more times to kind of stop and check in throughout the presentation and we can address your questions a little later on. So let's just, uh, this part of the, the presentation I think is just a little bit more fun and kind of trivia uh, to kind of get you familiar with some of the local watersheds uh, around the Woodlands area. Oh, I have to re-engage with my screen. There we go. Okay, so let's look now uh, a little bit more closely at this watershed area. So uh, earlier in the presentation, we looked at the lower Galveston Bay watershed, which is still in the background here in this kind of navy blue color. Uh, but now I wanna draw your attention to these kind of lighter green shades in the foreground. Um, and the, the general shape here actually represents the entirety of the San Jacinto River Basin. Uh, so we're not talking about what's draining necessarily into Galveston Bay. Uh, right now we're talking about what comes into the San Jacinto River first uh, before it makes it into the Galveston Bay. So it's a wide network of sub-watersheds even within this larger San Jacinto River Basin. Uh, and each of those sub-watersheds is highlighted in a different color here. Uh, I didn't go to the trouble of labeling them because that would be a lot to look at. Uh, but now let's draw our attention uh, closer to what's actually going on uh, around the woodlands. So if we go down one level, uh, now we're looking at uh, the Spring Creek watershed, which of course the majority of the woodlands uh, falls within the Spring Creek watershed. And I also wanted to point out some of the neighboring sub watersheds in this larger San Jacinto River Basin. Uh, and those are the West Fork San Jacinto River uh, sub watershed and the Lake Creek watershed, as well as the Cypress Creek watershed. And the reason I wanted to point these out is because these are areas that the Houston Galveston Area Council either has completed or is currently actively uh, developing watershed protection plans for, which is a term that I'll explain in more detail later and we'll, we'll get into the ins and outs of watershed protection plans. Uh, but I did just want to point out to you where these are in relation to the woodlands, uh, since I will be referencing them a little bit later. And this next slide is just kind of kind of for fun. Like I said, it's, it's really busy. I'm not going to quiz anybody on it, uh, but I did just want to show you uh, if we go even further down the rabbit hole and look at kind of uh, smaller watershed areas specific to different tributaries on Spring Creek, uh, this is what that would look like. Uh, so Spring Creek and also I think Lake Creek is represented here and also the West Fork of the San Jacinto River. Um, so just zooming in on the actual 
uh, woodlands area. Just wanted to bring to your attention all these different sub watersheds uh, that might be more relative to where you live uh, in with respect to the woodlands. So I just think that's kind of fun to look at, uh, kind of figure out what team you're on uh, based on where you live in the woodlands. And I also wanted to focus on what's actually going on with uh, water quality in the woodlands area um, on this slide. So as, as is the case with most of the, the Houston Galveston area region, uh, the most common impairment in the woodlands area uh, is resulting from high levels of fecal indicator bacteria in the waterways. And of course, um, Usually where we see this, uh, we also see high levels of nutrients. So that's not uncommon uh, in the woodlands area. And then uh, a little less common than the other two, but still happens often enough to be mentioned here is that we've detected low levels of dissolved oxygen in a few places. So that's something to keep an eye on. And then I wanted to bring up some other challenges uh, that may be impacting uh, water quality, or not water quality, but uh, just the environment uh, in the woodlands area that are not necessarily water quality impacts, but they do run pretty parallel uh, to how we respond to water quality challenges in this watershed. So at the top of the list is sedimentation. So from talking with uh, stakeholders in this area, I've heard that sedimentation is kind of a concern, especially near uh, the mouth of Spring Creek and Cypress Creek as they join up with the San Jacinto River, um, that that's where they see the most intensity of the sedimentation that's going on. Um, trash is also, I mean, it's, it's common all over the region, uh, but it's something that we want to focus on um, when we're talking about water improvement strategies or just environmental improvement strategies and also flooding. So again, flooding is not necessarily a water quality, it's more of a water quantity issue, uh, but it can directly affect uh, how we respond to addressing water quality uh, in this area. So again, that was just a little short section just to kind of walk you through the local geography uh, and talk about some of the challenges specifically faced in the woodlands area uh, before we move on to talking about uh, some of the steps we can take to improve water quality. So I think I saw more action in the chat. I will look at that now if my mouse will open it. Um, Oh, okay, so my department is, is pretty small. I think there's only uh, 10 or so of us on the team uh, in the water resources team. Uh, but once you expand that out to the community environmental department, that gets a little larger. I think that's closer to 30 people. Uh, but the as for the entirety of the Houston Galveston Area Council, um, that's about 250 employees. Uh, that work on different different projects throughout the region. So not just water quality. Um, I couldn't even begin to list off <laughs> everything well, think, that they're yeah. involved in. Right. So I, I would over the years it seems I, I I don't know if they still do it, but some of the the important things that they do is that uh, they put municipalities together, and if if, uh, if uh, people were buying fire trucks or police cars or whatever, they would join together and have these regions do it in one instead of having each one going out for bids etc so they got better prices and things like that for just for the for the uh, area also they're very involved in the transportation yes and highway and and uh, those plans that go to the state for approval for funding and things like that so there's a whole lot of them that we just need more in the water group right, <laughs> <But> right. <that's, laughs> We'd that's love just, to have more. Yeah. <laughs> that's just some of the stuff they do as well as, as this water issues. Right. And as for funding, I can speak to our water group. I know that a lot of the projects and especially the work that I'm talking about um, in this presentation is funded um, kind of by the, the Environmental Protection Agency by way of uh, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. So for watershed protection plans, we get money from the, the Clean Water Act Section 319 um, that, 
that funds our, our watershed protection plan development. Uh, I know we also get money from the, the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality for some of the work we do with uh, total maximum daily loads um, in watersheds throughout the region. Uh, so there is, there is a lot of government funding uh, going into that. Any more questions before we kind of get into the meat of the presentation here? All right, we'll go ahead and move on. So let's talk about um, how we actually take action and address some of these water quality impacts uh, and at which levels these actions can be carried out. So at the state and federal level, what we really count on entities like the Environmental Protection Agency uh, and the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality is regulation. So where there are uh, sources of pollution that we can control uh, in the watershed that might be having a direct impact on our waterways, we count on state and federal agencies uh, to regulate these sources and make sure that they're meeting uh, water quality standards. Uh, and so one thing that happens, you know, if these entities are found in violation of any of these water quality standards, uh, then state and federal agencies have the power to exercise fines. Um, and those fines in some cases can be redirected uh, to fund remediation and mitigation efforts uh, to improve water quality. So an example of that is uh, money from the Supplemental Environmental Projects Fund. Uh, and I believe that is when, uh, when a utility or, or other entity um, has a, a violation and has to pay a fine uh, to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, that money is redistributed uh, for environmental projects. And when that money gets um, redistributed through the Houston Galveston Area Council, we use that uh, to kind of remediate um, a lot of the problems with on-site sewage facilities throughout the region. So. A lot of times citizens may not have, you know, the personal resources uh, to either repair or replace a failing on-site sewage facility on their property. Uh, so through our supplemental, supplemental environmental projects uh, fund, we can actually help those homeowners uh, replace or repair their units, uh, which ultimately has broad ranging impacts on improving water quality. So that's one example of how those fines can kind of be redirected. Uh, and then again, as I mentioned before, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, shout out uh, these agencies for uh, funding a lot of the research and uh, work that we do uh, at the Houston Galveston Area Council in regards to water resources uh, and our projects therein. Um, but I won't speak to the availability of those funds. Uh, they're not throwing money around. We do have to, to work pretty hard uh, to apply for those resources and um, actually uh, get these projects off the ground. Uh, but I, I do want to mention that, that that is a role that state and federal government plays. So when we kind of trickle down into the local level, uh, we can look to local government efforts that might be involved in environmental quality issues. Uh, so I know you guys are in really great hands with the Woodlands Township Environmental Services Department. Um, they're a great resource uh, for a lot of educational tools uh, and so on for improving environmental quality in the Woodlands area. There's community activism as well. So if you're part of this group, then I'm assuming you already know how to find your way around a community activist group uh, focused on environmental quality. And then we also have watershed based plans, uh, which is kind of going to be the bulk of my talk today. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, that includes things like watershed protection plans and also total maximum daily load implementation plans and really the the whole idea behind these plans, even though there are nuances between the two uh, different types. Um, the real point that we're trying to drive home is that we want to involve communities uh, in actually taking an active role in uh, determining what the best water quality solutions are for their local watersheds. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, watershed protection plans. So here on the left, I just had to uh, brag on my colleague, Justin Bauer, who just completed the Cypress Creek Watershed Protection Plan. Uh, so that's page one of his document, which I think is so pretty, and I just wanted to include in the, the presentation. Uh, but a watershed protection plan 
uh, is a community-led uh, non-regulatory document. So the really great thing about these plans, as I mentioned before, is that uh, it's really the community members and the stakeholders who put this document together and decide uh, what goes into the Watershed Protection Plan. Uh, so when the houston Galveston Area Council uh, takes takes a role in these types of projects, we're really there as facilitators. So we set the meetings up, uh, we get different community members uh, at the same table so we can facilitate discussion uh, with those community members, but they really take, uh, they do the heavy lifting in terms of deciding on uh, the watershed strategies that they wanna see implemented to improve water quality. So the strategies that end up going into the watershed protection plan document are data-based. So that's another role that the, the HGAC uh, fulfills. Uh, we do a lot of uh, data analysis uh, in these watersheds, looking at the data that's been collected in monitoring events, uh, such as those carried out by the, the Clean Rivers Program. So we look at that data and other regional data uh, to kind of uh, get an idea of why um, these waterways are impaired, uh, what is leading to that impairment, and what we suggest as some of the basic strategies that can be uh, undertaken uh, to improve water quality. So that's a, that's a great start, uh, but we really need to enhance these strategies with local knowledge. So our data uh, is our best guess and estimation of what's going on in the watershed, but we need confirmation and feedback uh, from the local stakeholders to let us know how representative that data is of their watershed uh, because they know it better than we ever will. So we really, uh, we need that feedback and that involvement and engagement from our stakeholders to make a successful watershed protection plan document. Uh, and another really great feature about these watershed protection plans is that they are adaptable. So we know we're not working in a vacuum, we're not working in a static environment, and that there are going to be changes in the watershed in the coming years. So what we kind of build into these types of plans are checkpoints. So we can see you know, where we should be in our progress for improving water quality, especially in regards to reducing bacteria uh, by a certain point. And if we haven't met that goal or if we've overshot that goal, we can adapt the plan accordingly. So I think that's a really cool feature of these watershed protection plans. And then I did just want to point out uh, that those neighboring watersheds that we looked at a little bit earlier, um, through the Houston Galveston Area Council have completed uh, their watershed protection plans for the West Fork of the San Jacinto River, uh, which uh, for us, we included the, the Lake Creek watershed as well in that document. And then, like I mentioned, the Cypress Creek watershed uh, partnership has just wrapped up their watershed protection plan. It's off in the approval stage at this point, uh, so we should hear back from that uh, at some point this year uh, when that is approved. And then I'd also like to mention that we are currently planning uh, a watershed protection plan for Spring Creek. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that right here. So let's talk specifically about what's going on uh, in the Spring Creek watershed. So we had our first partnership meeting uh, in July of 2020. Of course, we had it virtually. So um, as is the story for uh, a lot of things that happened in 2020, we had grand designs at the beginning of the year that had to be altered significantly once uh, the pandemic took effect. So we had plans to start this uh, partnership earlier in the spring of 2020. Uh, but we did have to delay that. And then we had to take on this kind of virtual element uh, really just for our own safety and for the safety of our stakeholders, we wanted to make sure that we weren't uh, having group gatherings. Uh, so we did take on this virtual element and to the, to the stakeholders credit, we're really impressed with their involvement and their engagement and enthusiasm and the way that they've embraced uh, this virtual platform. So I can't shout out the Spring Creek Partnership enough for, for taking this crazy journey with us, because uh, we usually like to get into the watersheds and interact with our stakeholders directly face to face, but it just wasn't possible for this project. 
Uh, so since that July meeting, since our first kickoff meeting uh, in summer of 2020, we have developed some models to estimate the magnitude and source contribution of fecal indicator bacteria load, which sounds like alphabet soup. Uh, but what that means is we're just trying to determine uh, on a daily basis, how much bacteria do we expect to see in the waterways? And of that bacteria load, uh, what is contributing to it? So what are the sources uh, going into that overall load? And we also wanna pinpoint how much each one of those sources is contributing to the overall load. So we can kind of uh, identify what our real target sources are uh, for our water quality improvement strategies. Uh, so since we've developed those models, uh, we've been able to meet with work groups to discuss some of these strategies for improving water quality in the Spring Creek watershed. Uh, so our work groups are actually a select uh, group from the overall partnership. So the work groups are volunteers and kind of local experts who wanted to, to give their feedback and direct opinions on some of these uh, water quality improvement strategies that we want to uh, propose uh, for inclusion in the watershed protection plan. Uh, so that'll be the focus of our discussion at the next partnership meeting. So that will be held on Thursday, April 8th uh, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. via Zoom. And I can provide that link in the chat uh, after this presentation. Uh, if anybody would like to join us, we'd love to have you there. It's not too late to join up. So we'd love to have some more participation uh, from the woodlands, uh, especially because they're such an integral part of this watershed. <clears throat> uh, so let's talk about, we kind of went on a little bit of a tangent, but if we kind of remember the flow of this section. We started at the state and federal level, and then we moved down to the local level. And now let's talk about what we can do on the individual level. So, you know, it goes without saying that uh, we can do all this work um, on watershed protection plans and, and things like that, but we really don't have any momentum unless there's a uh, local buy-in. So at the individual level is really where these things are made or, or broken. Um, so we need your help to kind of build awareness of these plans taking place in the watershed. Um, we ask, um, you know, if you're so inclined uh, that you volunteer or become an ambassador with some of these local environmental groups. Uh, and there are plenty of personal actions that you can take uh, to have a positive benefit on water quality. So we'll talk about a few of those here. Uh, so let's talk about lawn maintenance. So this is a way that even at the household level, uh, you can have a really positive impact on the environment. So we know that nutrients that go into fertilizer are good for, for growing our gardens uh, and stimulating plant growth on the land. But the problem with that is um, it doesn't stay there, right? So <clears throat> These nutrients can be washed off from the land and ultimately end up in our waterways, which, as I mentioned before, can lead to algal blooms, uh, which can cause low dissolved oxygen, fish kills, and a number of other problems. So we just need to be mindful of what we're putting into the ground uh, that could ultimately end up in our waterways. Also, uh, lawn and garden waste, uh, such as grass clippings, uh, that's a form of organic debris. It's an actual physical obstacle. Uh, and it's also kind of a double-edged problem because um, those same contaminants that might be going into your garden from fertilizer uh, or pesticides might be carried on those actual uh, debris. So when that washes down, um, you know, if we're not properly managing those clippings and they end up in our waterways, uh, then it's not just a, a physical uh, uh, obstruction, it's also a vector for, for chemical uh, problems as well. Um, so we just need to make sure that we're uh, managing our, our lawn and garden waste. And some other tips that I'm sure uh, most of you know, because knowing this group, I think you're a little bit more well versed in these types of things uh, than maybe the average group that I talk to, uh, but just use conservation lawn and garden practices where you can. So if it's possible to work with native plants, uh, that's even better. They're going to be more acclimated to our environment, uh, to our weather patterns. So you may find that you don't need to use as much water uh, with a native plant versus uh, something exotic. 
Um, and yeah, you just want to be mindful of the amount of water that you're using for your lawn, uh, the types of things that you're using to grow your plants like fertilizers, uh, and the types of plants in your garden. So these are all just kind of helpful tips uh, if you want to make a more direct impact uh, on environmental quality. Uh, pet waste is another big one, especially in this area, uh, because there is so much kind of suburban development. Uh, so where we do see people, of course, we see pets. Um, and we, we expect this region to grow in the coming years. Uh, we expect to see more people moving in, and they're going to bring their pets with them. So this is an issue that we need to take very seriously in this watershed, because it does have some pretty broad ranging impacts on water quality. So this is, again is a vector uh, for uh, high levels of fecal waste in the waterways when this pet waste is not properly managed. Um, so we really urge you to use pet waste bags uh, and make sure that those bags make it to the proper disposal. So something that I'm hearing from talking with the, the stakeholder groups for this watershed area is that there is interest, there is kind of buy-in uh, from the community that they, they do want to manage pet waste and they make it at least to the, the pet waste bag stage, uh, but that bag doesn't always make it to the proper receptacle. So we're just asking that you take it all the way to the finish line. Uh, if you're using those pet waste bags, make sure they end up in the proper disposal, make sure they make it through some kind of waste management channel and are not just uh, kind of discarded in the environment and could ultimately end up in our waterways. So that kind of tackles the uh, domestic pet issue. But another another good strategy is just spaying and neutering your pets uh, to help control the feral animal population. So feral dogs and cats uh, can also impact uh, high levels of, of fecal in indicator bacteria in waterways. So as long as we're controlling that population, uh, we can also help to improve water quality. Okay, let's talk also about storm drains. Uh, so this photo was taken out in the woodlands uh, near Lake Woodlands. I believe this medallion was put out by the San Jacinto River Authority uh, to kind of let people know that whatever's uh, being dumped near this uh, uh, storm drain will ultimately end up straight in the lake because these storm drains flow directly to water bodies. So there's no treatment that happens uh, between a storm drain and a water body. Uh, so whatever ends up in there is ending up in our streams and rivers and so on. So we ask that you please uh, keep waste and other contaminants out of drains. So that includes uh, leaves and grass clippings, uh, any oils, soaps, or other household liquids. Uh, and of course, pet waste, we want to keep those out of the storm drain as well. I believe the, the way to remember it is only rain down the drain. So I've, I've heard that before, but I can't remember who to attribute it to. So somebody smarter than me made that rhyme. Uh, but just make sure that only water is going into the storm drains wherever you can help it. And so those slides were kind of the wagging of the finger, uh, but this I think is kind of ending on a more positive note. So this tells you about some volunteer opportunities that you can get involved with uh, to kind of help water quality in this region. Uh, so the Texas Stream Team is a, a really great organization. Um, it's a network of volunteers um, really throughout the state, uh, but they have their own base here in the, the Houston Galveston region. And if you want to learn more about Texas Stream Team, uh, you can visit the website at www.hgac.com uh, slash Texas-Stream-Team. And this, this group is actually, uh, I think I alluded to it before, um, a group of volunteer uh, members who actually take water quality samples that can kind of help act as a, an early warning system for us. Uh, so when it's time for our uh, Clean Rivers program sampling, uh, we can look at stream team data to kind of understand uh, what water bodies might need more attention. Uh, so that's a really great uh, thing that you can get involved with uh, if you want to get directly into those waterways and help make a difference. Uh, then there's also a few trash reduction events uh, that I wanted to bring your attention to. So uh, Trash Bash, if you're familiar, and I, I hope I don't get the order wrong, but I believe it's uh, Rivers, Lakes, 
bayous and bays or is it bays and bayous? I'm not sure, but the, the ultimate event is called Trash Bash. Uh, that has actually started today um, and it, it's going on through the weekend. So you can participate in Trash Bash from today uh, to the 28th of March. Um, and you can find information on that uh, at the website www.trashbash.org. Um, and it is a virtual event this year. So if you're not familiar with the story, uh, Trash Bash is an event that we've had going on for a while, uh, but last year it had to be canceled because it does take place in March, and that is right when everything locked down. Uh, so we did have to cancel it last year, but this year we're turning it into a virtual event. So uh, you can sign up online uh, to participate in the event and essentially just pick up trash and do cleanup events in your own neighborhood uh, and keep track of that uh, through the website and we can kind of get data that way. So that's really helpful to us and we encourage you to participate if you can. Um, but if you're more interested in a, a year round approach to clean up events, uh, so Trash Bash again only happens in March, uh, but if you wanna do more regular cleanups, you can look up and adopt a spot near you. Uh, and you can do that through the website, www.hgac.com uh, slash trash dash free dash Texas. Um, and find an adopt a spot near you that might need uh, volunteer help uh, with cleanups. And depending on which entity you represent, uh, you might also be able to propose a spot that needs to be adopted and maintained. Uh, so that's another good resource for you. Uh, and then there are plenty of local environmental organizations uh, to get uh, aligned with. Uh, so I know the, the Heartwood chapter of the Texas Master Naturalists does a lot of great work in the Woodlands area, so I recommend getting involved with that group if you're not already. Uh, there are plenty of conservation groups in this area. I'll go ahead and plug the uh, Bayou Land Conservancy that does great work um, out there. Uh, I was able to participate in their ambassador program last year, and I have nothing but good things to say. It gave me kind of uh, firsthand experience in the Spring Creek watershed, um, kind of getting to learn the natural areas around there. Uh, and it was a great time. So if you have a chance to do that, I'd, I'd recommend that. And also the Spring Creek Greenway is out there. So you can get aligned with those organizations and plenty more, I'm sure. So I, I encourage you uh, to seek out uh, some of these organizations and get involved. And really that is the end of my presentation. So I think we have a few more questions in the chat that I'll address. I did just wanna point out my contact information. Uh, it's probably easier to get me by email these days at rachel.windom at h-gac.com. And if you wanna learn more about our uh, watershed protection plans, I have those project sites listed here as well. So let me look at the chat and see what's going on. Yeah, uh, Rachel, I'm, I'm on too. I, I guess uh, let me just, do them in this order. You show the picture of the storm drain marking project. That's that, that's also something that uh, the Woodlands Green and the Woodlands Township, we're now trying to get that done uh, to mark them. It's gonna be a special project. And I think Terry's still on the line. And as Deborah points out, that'll be an effort starting in one of our uh, neighborhoods and then spreading, I hope. But, We'll be doing that in conjunction with volunteers, Girl Scouts and whatever, so that we can start marking and show them that all this stuff, where it goes, right? So that's, right. That'll, that'll be an extension of that project. I had a question about mulching grass, which I do, of course, and I think Bob Daly would agree it's the thing to do. Does it not get washed into the, to the stream? My answer was that when you mulch it like that, fine, that it goes down to the base of the grass and it's not so likely to, to wash off. Is that mm. accurate? Be with that? Oh, yeah. I I know very little about lawn maintenance. I have a, an apartment with a very small patio and that's, <laughs> that's the extent that I know. <laughs> I wanted to first thank you for doing this, but I also wanted to ask some questions about, you know, in the studies that we've done so far, water quality on Spring Creek, um, we've mentioned that the fact that because of the E. coli bacteria that Spring Creek, as lovely as it is, 
uh, is impaired or rated impaired by the state, meaning that those levels of bacteria are too high for, for contact by human. So I think we've also agreed that the bulk of that is from pet waste in the, in the woodlands area. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the case. And I think that I wanted to point out that you, you had a picture of the pet waste station about things that we as individuals can do. Uh, we have a board member, we had a presentation two years ago about the West Fork partnership. And uh, as a result, one of our board members took it upon herself to lobby the, the township with success. And between the two, they got uh, several more stations installed. And as you said, I think that's something that people can do because you know we can pick up trash, we can do a lot of things, but when it comes to bacteria, it's, it's a major problem. And, and that's the only way to fix that is to pick up behind our uh, pets because they're not gonna go away. I mean, you've got some statistics about how many dogs live out here. So <laughs> right. that's one thing I wanted to point out that, that people can do things to help fix this problem, whether it's clean up. Uh, I would also mention that the Woodlands Township and the Woodlands Green and others all participated in a green up last weekend where we all went out and picked up trash also virtual this, this year. Mm -hmm. we, we skipped the party, but those <laughs> yeah. are things that, that we do here. But uh, again, my concern is, my personal concern is the bacteria. And so I think we need to, to focus on that as well. Right. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? I think, uh, as, and you also mentioned lawn care, uh, all those algae, et cetera, like the nitrogen you send down when you over fertilize and over water your lawns. Mm -hmm. We can all do that, try to back off on watering and back off on the fertilizers and things that go down there. Because by the time they get to the bayou or the, or the uh, bayou, as they say, or the Spring Creek, I mean, it, it can have a very detrimental effect. And once the algae blooms start, the fish start to die. So everything we do impacts that stream. Right. And then the stream impacts so I do see a question in the chat yeah, go here. Ahead. I was say, go ahead and answer that one. For me. Okay. Uh, from Helen that says, is there coordination between the Spring Creek Partnership and the Texas Water Development Board effort to develop a plan for Spring Creek flood control mitigation? And uh, we do have some of our colleagues working with that effort, uh, but there's not a lot of crossover currently with the Spring Creek Partnership, uh, just because we're more focused on water quality in Spring Creek, uh, and the, the flood control mitigation project is, is more water quantity issue. Uh, but we do hope to kind of bring those together as this, this plan uh, works closer and closer to formation over time. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, that's an important project. And I, I know Helen's talking from that, that flood area. We, oh. we are hoping to in, participate in that and get more involvement from Spring Creek in the woodlands and Definitely. Montgomery County. I wanted to point out, as, as Terry says, there were 737 volunteers, 8,000 pounds of trash picked up on Saturday. Wow. Uh, so good news is we picked it up. The bad news is there's 8,000 pounds of trash to pick up. <laughs> right. I think uh, also the, the, I would urge people to attend the April 8th meeting. She got the, the uh, link there. This is just the beginning of the Spring Creek partnership to define the problems and then, then uh, come up with the best management practices to make it better. Right. And so input at this level is very important. And I hope everybody will spread that word and also attend that meeting on the 8th. I think um, any other questions, I don't see anything else, but there are several people on, on today, tonight that uh, 
I recognize the names and I know they've been involved in these projects. Uh, but again, the whole goal is to, to let everyone know about this. We have a little more than 100,000 people in the woodlands and uh, we need to educate about 100,000 more. <laughs> we also have, uh, one of the things about Montgomery County is that we have um, a tremendous amount of vacant land. The population's mm -hmm. growing, but we still have huge amounts of land to be developed. And uh, one of our goals needs to be, in my opinion, to develop that in a reasonable way so that we do the riparian areas, that we keep the grasses and trees in place, that we have an opportunity to do that here. It's not available in a lot of counties around here. So true. that's important. It all starts here. That's right. <laughs> no questions for Rachel. Rachel, really appreciate it. Uh, terrific presentation. and. Uh, I appreciate you coming to us live from your kitchen. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm so glad that you invited me. Thank you for having me. And I do appreciate everybody for taking the time to attend. And like I said, it's all about spreading the word. A lot of us, we don't want to end up preaching to the choir. We have to go, <laughs> we have to go out and spread the word. That's so right. So if there's nothing else, thank you so much. And, and we'll shut her down. All right.